What's the one thing a knight, a samurai, and an Indian warlord have in common? A sword. No matter the geographical location or time period, these metallic instruments of death always have been at the forefront of wars, and even now, they are just as useful as they were a century ago. How are these weapons made? And just how much effort goes into making a sword? Let's find out. Step 1. Choosing and preparing the raw materials. The first step in making the sword is obviously choosing and preparing the raw materials. Modern swords are made out of steel. Steel is an alloy of carbon and iron. The amount of carbon in the alloy has to be very precise and differs from the swordsmith to swordsmith. Carbon adds hardness, but too much carbon can lead to the sword becoming brittle and more likely to fracture. The amount of carbon added to the sword is usually between 0.6 to 0.9% of the total alloy. This carbon is added by a process called cementation. Pieces of steel are added to a container with a very high carbon contact. The container is heated to a very high temperature for several days. This causes some of the carbon for the container to migrate into steel. Once the steel is ready, the next step of the procedure starts. Step 2. Forging The swordsmith can choose whichever method they would like to use for the process to metal. The method can be used to mass produce swords nowadays is stock removal. In this process, large sheets of steel are cut by lasers to make swords. Higher end swords, on the other hand, are made by forging. And since forging is what most swordsmiths prefer, thanks to flexibility, that's what we're going with today. Forged swords are created by heating the metal and pounding it into the desired shape. The steel is placed into the forge and heated to a temperature between 1200 to 1800 Fahrenheit. Once the steel is red hot, the swordsmith starts to hammer it into shape. First, the swordsmith draws out the steel to increase its length and then tapers out the edges. All the while, the steel is continuously heated and cooled. The entire sword isn't heated every time, and the swordsmith usually works six to eight inches segments at a time. At certain points during the forging process, the bladesmith will usually normalize the steel. Normalization is when the sword is heated and then set to cool without any hammering. What normalization does is that it lets a crystalline structure of the steel that has been disrupted by constant hammering going back to normal. During normalization, another process called untonization is also occurring side by side. Untonization is a mixing of carbon and iron molecules, and it leads to a more uniform composition of the blade. Without authorization, certain sections of the swords with higher carbon content will be more brittle and prone to fracturing. Step 3. Annealing Annealing is the last step before the blade is sharpened. On the surface, annealing looks very similar to normalization. The blade is heated to a high temperature and cooled very slowly. Usually, an insulating material is also used so that the blade can be cooled even slower. Annealing gets rid of all the internal stresses in the blade, created by forging. It also makes the blade soft and easy to sharpen. This step takes a day or two. The longer the annealing is done, the more stable the blade is. Step 4. Sharpening once the blade has been softened, it is time to sharpen it. Sharpening can be done by various methods, depending on the type of sword and the amount of carbon used in it. Most swordsmiths use a wet whetstone to sharpen the blade. However, an electronic belt grinder can also be used to achieve a similar result. Some people also use flies to sharpen the blade. In a double-edged sword, such as the long blade, both edges of the sword are sharpened. In katanas or single-edged swords, however, only one edge is sharpened and the other unsharpened edge is called a back. Usually, the entire length of the blade is sharpened, but in this case, the sword is too heavy to be used by one hand. Irikaso may be added. Irikaso is an unsharpened area of the blade, present immediately after the guard or handle to improve the handling. Step 5. Quenching and Tampering Now that our sword has been sharpened, it's time to harden it again. This is where unthanization comes into play again. This time, instead of a forge, a high temperature salt bath is used to heat the sword. A salt bath offers a much more uniform temperature distribution, and as a result, the end product is a blade that holds its edge for much longer. The salts are heated, and the sword is left in the salt bath anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Once the blade is ready to be taken out of the molded salt and immediately added to a quench tank, a quench tank is filled with an oil and used to lower the temperature of the sword rapidly. 
Quenching creates very hard steel called mentorites. Quenching the blade for too long or too slowly can warp the blade or even shatter it. How long a blade needs to be quenched for varies depending on the material, and most swordsmiths insist the timing is based on instinct. The hardness of the blade is based on the number of times it is quenched. However, instead of alternization, the blade is tempered at a comparatively lower level. The blade is heated up to 1200 Fahrenheit and quenched again and again until the hardiness is just right. Too much hardness and the blade becomes brittle, prone to break. Too much softness and the blade can't hold its sharpness. When making Japanese katanas, a very unique method of heat treatment is used. Japanese swordsmiths cover the unsharpened edge of the sword with clay. This slows down the cooling on one side of the blade and makes it curve. This adds flexibility to the katana, and if done right, can help it stay sharper for longer too. Step 6. Finishing After the blade has been sharpened, it is time to add the finishing touches. A metal guard is attached to the handle of the blade, and a pommel or counterweight is added too. Once the pommel has been added, clumps of wood are added to the hilt to make the sword easier to hold. Depending on the design, leather or wire is also added for the better grip and aesthetic purposes. The company logo or trademark is also etched onto the sword, at this point of using electrochemical techniques. With everything done and dusted finally, after a final polishing, the sword is ready. Let's take a look at the history of swords. The earliest known swords were made of copper. Copper was abundant, malleable, and easy to sharpen. Unfortunately, it was also much softer than swordsmith would have liked to have it, and to have it be sharpened again and again to keep the blade from being dull. The next material that accomplished and widespread for use of swords was bronze. Bronze was an alloy of tin and copper. Swordsmiths learned that by carefully adding just a small amount of tin when purifying the copper, they could easily make an alloy that was harder, yet at the same time more flexible than copper. This meant that swords made from bronze were less likely to break and didn't need to be sharpened as regularly as copper ones. After the Bronze Age, swordsmiths moved to iron. Iron required some extra work when it came to purification, but the swords were made better than the bronze ones. They were harder and didn't chip or fracture when used in hard targets. One small step was still left before swordsmiths finally settled on raw materials. However, this change happened after the discovery of steel. Steel eventually became the new norm for sword making. The Japanese used it for their world famous katanas, whereas the English knights used it for their long swords. The method of making swords also changed with time. And now, instead of spending days in the workshop, hand cutting and forging the steel, modern machinery and computer guided lasers are used now. Click one of the two videos on the screen right now.